Number 10, Lionel Tate. Starting off our list, we have Lionel Tate. It was 2001 and Lionel was play fighting with another friend, so he says. She was actually a neighbor and at just 13 years old, Lionel did something that day that made him one of the youngest criminals in history to ever receive a life sentence. He was 13 years old, he was barely a teenager. He had to receive a life sentence because he had taken these pro wrestling moves, as he calls them, too far. He had told authorities it was an accident, but but it was very clear that she had been attacked brutally. It was awful. Her wounds were sadly fateful, which of course led to the life sentence of one Lionel Tate. Now in 2010, it was ruled unconstitutional for teens to receive life sentences unless it was murder. This is obviously cause for debate. Number nine, Brian Lee Draper. This one's actually two criminals for the price of none. Brian Lee Draper and his partner, Tori Adamick, both were sentenced to life at just 16 years old. It was disgusting and vile to say the least. They both planned this horrific attack. They hid in their classmate's closet and then they both violently attacked her. She had 29 stab wounds. Cassie Jo Stoddard was killed because two 16 year olds hid in her house and then cut the power. That's terrifying. I cannot imagine how scary that must have been. Reminder, both of them are serving life sentences. It doesn't feel like enough almost, you know what I mean? Like you read about her injuries and what happened and the whole incident. One life sentence doesn't feel like enough in this case, so I get it. A lot of these cases, people get six life sentences. I'm like, yep, more than fair. Number eight, Eric Smith. We go back now to 1993. I wasn't even born yet, but Eric Smith, he was 13 years old and he couldn't contain his rage towards another youngin. Now Eric himself was bullied growing up. He didn't get along with anybody. And one day he decided to attack somebody violently with a rock. He had lured them into the woods first away from the park. And then just like that, that was it. Smith is of course a lot older now. And in total, he's been denied parole eight times. Yeah, probably nine by the time this video goes out, realistically. I hope he never gets out. I don't know, this is something I don't think you can bounce back from, to be honest with you. That's, uh, that's some Michael Myers if I'm being honest. Number seven, Kenneth Young. His last name is literally Young. It's quite ironic and also extremely brutal, this one. Young was 15 years old and he was faced with a situation that nobody should have to face, let alone face it at such an early age. Kenneth Young was threatened by a narcotics dealer. He forced Kenneth to partake in his illegal dealings, specifically that of an armed robbery, or else he would take Kenneth's mother and he would hurt her. Now, Kenneth did what he was asked, rather did what he was forced to do, but one night when said dealer was assaulting a woman, Kenneth attacked the dealer and in turn he received four concurrent sentences of 30 years. Now the dealer in question, he was 24 and he forced Kenneth to be involved in three armed robberies and one attempted armed robbery, all in a 30 day period. That dealer only received a single life sentence. Yeah, not all these are the best judgments I would say. Number six, Evan Miller. It was 2003. The Alabama prisoner was only 14 years old at the time when he was sentenced to life after killing Cole Cannon. During the pandemic, Evan Miller was actually resentenced to life without parole. The judge considered Miller's early exposure to violence and abuse. But ultimately the judge concluded with quote, the crime is why we are here. We are not here because Mr. Miller shuddered abuse at the hands of his father, end quote. Fair, you gotta keep it in the lane that you're operating in. Given that Miller was found the principal aggressor, that ship has sailed. Now before I continue, I wanna do a quick shout out to our history channel, Bumblebee. We do a lot of top tens over there as well, but it's all Victorian criminals, gladiator history, those really long pointed shoes that some people would wear, dark stuff like that, it's a great time. Bumblebee, go check it out after we're done here. I'll see you there myself. Number five, Bobby Bostick. It was a rough go for Bobby his entire life, and by age 10, he was partaking in illegal narcotics. By age 13, he was stealing cars, and while still on copious amounts of said narcotics, come December 1995, Bobby Bostick was only 16, and he was at a friend's house. Everybody was involved in all these illegal substances, just, you know, stuff you shouldn't be consuming at a young age, and Bobby got into an altercation with another female at the same house. Bobby was 16 when he was found guilty of 17 different horrible crimes that took place that night. All consecutive sentences, also, which is a horrible sign. Bobby Bobby, as of right now, is set to live in prison until January 2091. Yeah, he will be 112 by time that sentence is up, so 
yeah, you probably won't ever get out. Number four, Frederick Prichette. On November 29th, 2012, Prichette was only 17 years old, which at this point is kind of old in this list, you would say. He was just 17 when he was sentenced to 55 years in prison for armed robbery and kidnapping and motor vehicle theft. That's a nasty three right there. But things get even worse, dare I say. Cut to less than a month later, Frederick Prichette was charged with aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer and robbery involving an incident while still in custody. Can you believe that? It's all happened after he had received 55 years at the Lauderdale County Detention Center. All of a sudden, a correctional officer hands a cup of water to Prichette, and that's when he grabbed her arm, put his arm around her neck, and then held her for about two minutes before ultimately releasing her. Her cell phone was also later found in his cell. So it comes to no surprise that he was convicted again for these acts, and this time around, he was given an additional 45 years, so he won't be released until 2111. I'm not even gonna say the years. 2111. That sounds like it's so far away. 2111. No way. 2111? No. They all sound so fake and weird. They all sound so wrong. I remember when, like, 1999, I was like, all right. That's cool. 2002, you're like, yeah. Yeah, it's 2111. You're like, Jesus, slow down. What? That's so many numbers. Number three, John Chabelle. Back in 1994, John Chabelle was only 17 years old and he managed to get sentenced to a total of 95 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Big yikes. See, Bell was convicted of armed robbery, burglary, and two counts of kidnapping. Again, that is a nasty bundle of offenses. And the worst part about all of this, he was sentenced as a habitual offender meaning that chances of getting out are now slim to none. Jake Howard, an attorney with the MacArthur Justice Center in Mississippi, he argues that, quote, Mr. Bell's aggregated sentence guarantees that he will die in prison, end quote. Now, as we near the end of our list today, I have to ask, do you agree with these sentences so far? Do you think being locked up until you're 113 years old is a fair punishment ever? Or do you believe that people have the opportunity to change? Comment down below. Obviously, it you know, depends which case, but it's tough. Number two, Stephen Thomas. Stephen Thomas pleaded guilty in 2007 in Madison County Circuit to kidnapping, forcible sexual and armed robbery. Again, horrible stuff. Thomas was only 17 at the time and he was sentenced to 70 years. Thomas later asked the court for an evidentiary hearing in his case and argued that his sentence was cruel and an unusual punishment and the court denied his petition. So he will be there until the absolute rest of his life. And finally, number one, Edward Lamont Neal. Now forced to serve 95 years behind bars, Edward Lamont Neal committed, as you would have guessed, a handful of horrific crimes. He was initially sentenced to five years for that initial offense, and then not soon after, got five years for jail escape in Lowndes County. Now you doubled your sentence, all because you watched the Shawshank Redemption and you felt inspired. You wanted to make a run for it. It's not worth it. But he was later convicted of burglary on an unoccupied dwelling. Not great. And he was subsequently given 25 more years in prison. Later, in a separate case, Edward Lamont Neal was given 60 years as a habitual offender after being convicted for armed robbery and aggravated assault. So he won't be out until 2098. In other words, he won't be out. Probably not ever, unless a skeleton walked out of the jail, and that's the only way we'd see him walk out. Starting off this countdown, we have Richard Matt. Matt's career as a criminal started off when he was young. He was involved in robberies, kidnappings, and then eventually murder. The first murder he committed was of his former boss. He then fled to Mexico to avoid being caught. While there, he murdered a second man while attempting to rob him. In 2007, he was convicted for the murders and began serving a 25 year to life sentence. But guess what? 2015, he actually escaped the facility with a fellow inmate, and they spent 20 days on the run before getting recaught. And apparently, he has a history of jailbreaks. So I don't know why they just didn't pay closer attention to him. In the end, this was his final escape since he was caught and killed by Border Patrol while trying to flee to Canada. In our ninth spot, we have the dating game killer. This dude gets his name because while police were looking for him, he appeared on TV for an episode of the dating game in 1978. He did this in the midst of his murder spree. In fact, the dater on the show actually chose him, but when they met afterwards, she said that she got a bad feeling around him and they never actually went on a date, which that was a close call for her. 
because during his appearance on the show, he had already murdered at least five women. His date would have probably been his next victim. This killer would often toy with his victims. He would strangle them until they lost consciousness, then he would revive them and then repeat this process several times before taking their lives. In the end, he was convicted of murdering five women, but police think that his kill count is much, much higher. In our eighth spot, we have the razor blade. This story comes from a prisoner who was locked away in a Texas prison. The prisoner told the story of a fellow inmate who everyone feared. It was this woman who would violently lash out on her fellow inmates. One time, she even put a razor blade in a bar of soap and would use it to cut up other prisoners. When the guards found them, there was blood everywhere. So yeah, I can see why people fear her. I wouldn't want to get on her bad side, let alone even look at her. Moving on to number seven, we have Ronnie McPeters. One of the scariest inmates in the world is said to be Ronnie McPeters. Ronnie was sent to jail for the murder of a 27 year old woman in 1984. The woman, Linda Marie Baltazar, was running errands when Ronnie came up to her window panhandling. She shooed him away and he left, but then he ended up coming back, this time armed. He then shot her five times. As a result, he was arrested and sent to Fresno jail. But his bad behavior never stopped. While in jail, he would set fires, attack other prisoners, and even sometimes would, you know, smear his feces on the walls and floors and sometimes all over his body. Now, he was actually put on death row for his crimes, but he was deemed, and I quote, too insane to be executed. In our sixth spot, we have Joanna Danahy. Joanna is a serial killer who, in March of 2013, went on a 10 day killing spree. She murdered three men, but her goal was to murder nine. She said she wanted to be like the killers, Bonnie and Clyde. After killing the men, she would throw their bodies in ditches. In fact, she has the title of one of Britain's most notorious female murderers. While in prison, Joanna has made it a point to prove to other serial killers that she is the best killer among them. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the inmate from hell. So, this story comes from a nurse who worked at a prison. She shared the story of the scariest inmate that she has ever encountered. This inmate would go around biting officers in their arms and shoulders. He would headbutt them as well as even punch them directly in the face. He has broken people's bones and even ripped out chunks of flesh off of them with his teeth. Yeah, that must have been terrifying to see, like what the heck? Moving on to number four, we have Pascal Payet. Pascal Payet is a French criminal who was sent to jail for committing a murder during a robbery in 1997. But he is famous for his daring prison escapes. In 2001, this dude managed to escape prison using a hijacked helicopter. But he didn't perform this stunt just once. No, no, he escaped twice. So obviously, he was caught and then sent back to jail. Then in 2007, he did it again. It only took him five minutes. Within that time frame, four masked men hijacked a helicopter and took the pilot hostage. They then landed on the roof of the prison and used some device to open the doors and get Pascal out of his cell. Like I said, they were in and out within five minutes. Two days after this escape, an arrest warrant was issued against him. Nowadays, he is never kept at the same prison for more than six months, and he is placed in solitary confinement where he is under high surveillance. They don't want him escaping for a third time. In our third spot, we have Damien Folks. All right, folks, let's talk about Damien Folks. See what I did there? Anyways, this guy, don't get me started. So, this guy was serving a life in term in jail for armed robbery. While in jail, he attacked a number of prisoners. He strangled killer Colin Hatch with strips of bedding and also slashed the throat of Soham murderer Ian Huntley. And this is what he had to say to that. He said, I hope I killed him. I've been planning it for weeks. Now, Ian Huntley did survive, but he had a seven inch wound that just missed his jugular vein. But that's why Damien is considered incredibly dangerous. In our second spot, we have Mark Hobson. Mark Hobson went on a killing spree in North Yorkshire, England in 2004. As a result, he took the lives of four people. But he was also involved in a nationwide manhunt, which involved more than 500 police officers and 12 police forces all looking for him. During that time, he was considered Britain's most wanted man. 
And this is another dude that is not afraid to get violent with others. In September of 2005, he poured a bucket of boiling water over a fellow killer. And on a number of other occasions, he has attacked other prisoners. As a result, he is another prisoner who is kept under close surveillance at all times. And in our number one spot today, we have Robert Maudsley. Robert Maudsley has actually been named Britain's most dangerous prisoner. Now you might be wondering, Lindsay, why is that? Well, oh boy, let me tell you. In 1977, Maudsley and his fellow inmates held another prisoner hostage. They tortured him for nine hours before cracking his head open and killing him. And rumor has it that he even ate some of the prisoner's brain. As a result, he was deemed the real life Hannibal Lecter. A couple months later, he murdered two other inmates, then casually told the prison officer that during the next roll call, he would be too short. As a result, he's actually kept in an isolated glass cell so guards can see what he's up to at all times. They don't want another hostage situation to occur ever again. Number 10. Abigail Williams. I'm putting Abigail Williams on this list because the whole ordeal just makes me so mad. By claiming that she was bewitched, she sparked a massive witch hunt, literally one of the most illogical points in history, leading to the most unnecessary deaths of so many people. Ugh, I hate her. I can't even watch a production of The Crucible without needing to break stuff after. It makes me so mad. Look, I don't know whether her claims were true that she and the other girls were afflicted because of witchcraft or the more likely latter event of them eating an infected piece of grain. Maybe, maybe that happened, but I'll let you decide. Abigail Williams was living with her uncle, Reverend Samuel Paris, and started practicing mild witchcraft with his daughter and Tatuba and John Indian, his slaves. You know the kind of witchcraft where you drop an egg in the water and see the name of your future husband or I don't know, like where you're gonna go tomorrow, that kind of stuff. Apparently they saw a coffin in the glass and that freaked them out. So they started acting weird. Other girls followed suit. Keep in mind they were around 11 or 12. So, all right, imagination. And then Abigail just kept accusing people like all the time. And if you admitted you were a witch, you were pardoned. And if you didn't, you were killed, okay? So technically she was never in prison but she put a lot of people there on bullshit and then they claimed possession to get out. So I say that this deserves to be number 10. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> number nine, Luis Zambrano. Luis was a man from Queens who took the life of his ex-girlfriend, Angie Escobar, in her Whitestone home. She was just 28 years old and had just broken up with him when he violently attacked her, inflicting 80 wounds with a pair of scissors. But he didn't just claim that he was heartbroken, no. The reason he killed her was because of one, trust issues, that's a given, she's an ex for a reason, and two, you guessed it, demonic possession. A quote from Luis reads, quote, if you believe in demonic possession, you'd know I was under the influence of drugs and alcohol. I barely remember what happened, unquote, he said. Dude, they caught you, just fess up, man. The devil doesn't just conveniently show up when you do something really awful, okay? He's busy building the next Apple update and creating pop-up ads, okay? Thankfully, the court saw right through him and sentenced Sambreno to 26.5 years in prison. Game over, Satan. Number eight, Edward Guzman Rodriguez. In Virginia back in 2011, Rodriguez performed a violent exorcism, if you can even call it that, on his very young daughter. He attempted to rid her of the demon he believed was inside her and it ended up costing her her life. When police arrived at the scene, several people were holding Bibles outside their home. Edder stated that while he took his daughter's life, he too was also possessed by a bad spirit. Yeah, it's called being an awful human being. Look it up. The girl was found on a bed wrapped in a blanket surrounded by Bibles. Guzman had also knocked his wife unconscious so she wouldn't be able to stop the exorcism. To this day, he stands by his claim while also admitting to the crime. Guzman was sentenced to 20 years and 11 months in prison. Number seven, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. Man, I hate how this guy is on every list, but here he is again. An interview was released that Rader believed it was a demon that pushed him to take the lives of those 10 people. By now, if you follow our channel or are a true crime fan, you know what BTK stands for. 
And if you don't, Google it because YouTube won't let me say it. Radar was a very religious man and was a leader in his community, but despite his connection to godliness, Radar confessed that he believes a demon entered him when he was a young boy. How convenient, as that's when he started to notice his dark side. He told Larry Hatberg during an interview and I quote, how could a guy like me, a church member, raise a family, go out and do those sorts of things, he said. Quote, I personally think, and I know it's not very Christian, but I actually think it's a demon that's within me, unquote. or you're just an awful human being saying it together. That's great. Let's move on. Number six, David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. The son of Sam terrorized NYC for a period in the 1970s and was finally caught in 1977. He would carry out what appeared to be random shootings, claiming six lives, wounding seven more with a .44 caliber revolver. David frequented lovers' lanes and women even went to salons to rid themselves of brown hair so they wouldn't be targets because they thought that was his thing. Alongside the crimes, postal worker turned shooter blamed his actions on his neighbor's dog, who he said was actually possessed by a 6,000 year old demon. Apparently his name was Harvey and Berkowitz was simply following his instructions. Number five, Pazazu Algarid. Now this one is a little freaky because one of the people who lived in the same building as Pazazu swore he was possessed. The name Pazazu is actually the name of the demon mentioned in the film, The Exorcist. Pazazu was arrested after authorities discovered a dead body in his backyard, along with another that he helped his wife bury a year prior. If there's anyone on this list that could actually have been possessed, then it might have been this guy, maybe number one. He was a satanic fanatic and even went so far as to fork his own tongue and saw his teeth razor sharp. Ugh. An anonymous quote from the man who lived with Pizazu said, quote, it was very serpentine and his eyes would kind of get a little like glazy, like almost not there. Like the inner part of him would kind of phase away. You could tell when his demons needed something from him because they took over, unquote. Ugh. Also important to note that the house that he lived in was so gross, it was deemed unsafe for human life. There was filth, human and not everywhere, demonic and evil symbols on the walls. Ugh, yeah, not a place you'd want to find yourself, especially since the man who lived there might have been the demon Pazazu himself. Number four, Michael Taylor. I swear there was something about the 70s that just like bred crazy whack with serial killers. Like anyone else feel that way? Were they just there all along when we finally started to notice? I don't know, but we have yet another serial killer on our list who also claimed possession. Even before he violently took his wife's life, Taylor suspected that he was possessed by a demonic spirit. He was a simple butcher living in Osset, England, who was suddenly overcome by a darkness he couldn't explain. He underwent an overnight exorcism performed on him on October 5th, 6th in 1974, and though it reportedly worked, some of the demons, yes, plural, kept hanging on. According to someone involved, they invoked and cast out at least 40 demons, though three remained. They were pretty bad. After he returned home, he viciously took the life of his wife, removing her eyes and tongue, most of her skin from her face, and took their pet's life as well. When police found Taylor, he was standing in the street, covered in blood, yelling, quote, it is the blood of Satan, unquote. I don't know what to believe about that one. Demonic possession doesn't seem like an afterthought here, whereas it does with the other ones, so what do you think, guys? Number three, Deborah and Adolfo Gomez. Okay, whether for five minutes or 10 years, we all believed at some point that the prophecy about 2012 being the end of the world was true. But it appears no one believed as hard as Deborah and Adolfo Gomez, who were not only convinced that 2012 was the end of the world, but that their house was possessed by a demon. Yeah. The couple was arrested after restraining their children with duct tape in their SUV because they also were demon possessed. Apparently they would often cover their eyes and mouths with duct tape in order to keep the demons out. Oh my God. When police finally caught up with them in Lawrence, Kansas, they also discovered that Adolfo hadn't slept for nine days. How that happened, we don't know, but it may explain why he thought he was possessed. Sleep deprivation can cause some serious harm. The longest anyone has ever gone without it, I think was 11 days. And after just four or five days of no sleep, people start to hallucinate. So maybe that's the reason. Number two, Aljar Schwartz. In 2013, Aljar Schwartz from South Africa claimed he had become possessed by vague satanic attacks. Of course. 
He wouldn't be on this list if he didn't. This was verified by reference Cecil Begbie and confirmed that this was the cause for Schwartz's crime. He strangled and then beheaded his victim in an abandoned school in October of that year. Oh my god. Reports say that Alger planned on selling the head to a traditional healer. He was caught and incarcerated, however, but his community stood behind him, weirdly. Reverend Begbie instructed church groups across Africa to pray for Schwartz on the Good Friday following his arrest. Schwartz reportedly felt like pure water was washing over him at the time of the prayer, and now claims the demons are no longer in possession of him. This, however, will not mitigate his sentence. And lastly, number one, Arn Cheyenne Johnson. Johnson sparked controversy far and wide in a case that became known as the Devil Made Me Do It case. In 1981, 19-year-old Arn Cheyenne Johnson was arguing with Alan Bono over Johnson's girlfriend when Arn stabbed Bono to death. When authorities arrived, you can guess what Johnson said, the devil made me do it hence the title of the case. So you'd expect the officer to be like, nah, nah, whatever, buddy, keep on walking, but no. There is a reason this case is in our number one spot. Every paranormal investigator worth their salt, including the beloved, Ed and Lorraine Warren flocked to Connecticut to interview him. But the Warrens were there to defend him because they already knew him. The Warrens told police that in July 1980, Johnson had participated in at least three exorcisms involving his girlfriend's 11-year-old brother, David. He reportedly was host of 43 Demons. The Warrens stated that at the time of the exorcism, and I quote, Johnson leaped up and cried to the demon, come into me, I'll fight you, come into me. From that time on, he was possessed. Quote. The paranormal society was split in two, but Johnson's team was committed. The court had defended accounts of God in the past. Now it was time to defend accounts of the devil. But despite what you may believe, it wasn't enough and Johnson received maximum sentence, but was released after good behavior just four years later. Number 10, the eyeball man. Can anyone honestly say they aren't scared of this guy? The dude blacked out his eyeball, so he looked like a demonic Jack Skellington. More like Hack Skellington. Eyeball man's real name is Jason Barnum and is currently living out a 22 year sentence for shooting an Alaska police officer. Barnum's crime was heavily influenced by a hefty addiction to chasing the dragon. Three officers were investigating vehicle break-ins and burglaries in South Anchorage and spotted a vehicle related to the attacks in a hotel parking lot. They checked out the security footage and saw a man carrying a tote to room 209. Barnum and two others were in the room and when officers entered the bathroom, the shootout began. Barnum was injured in the arm, but they arrested him when he got out of the hospital and they had to deal with how terrifying he looks, even though he's behind bars, so yeah. Number nine, Eric R. Rudolph. Resourceful and resilient, Eric R. Rudolph quickly got on America's most wanted list. Why? Well, during 1996 to 1998, Eric detonated bombs four times in Atlanta and Birmingham, taking the lives of two people and injuring thousands. A five year manhunt ensued. He was finally caught in May 2003 after he was found rummaging through a dumpster. Later, it was revealed how intense his survival skills were. For five years, Eric foraged off the lands and survived off of buried barrels of grain and soy. He learned the schedules of when produce was going to be thrown out at grocery stores and stole what he could where it wouldn't be noticed. His motivation behind the bombings was a compilation of radical anti-gay, anti-abortion, and anti-government. The list goes on. He didn't get along with other people and when he confessed to his crimes, he showed no remorse. But when he was taken away to go to prison, authorities report that the man had tears in his eyes, knowing he was utterly defeated. What can I say, man? Your actions brought you to where you are now, so sorry about it. Sorry, not sorry. Number eight, Robert P. Hansen. The man the FBI was afraid of and he was right under their noses. Joining them for lunch in the cafe, grabbing coffee with them, laughing at the cooler. But all the while, Robert P. Hansen was a mole. On February 18th, 2001, Robert was arrested and charged with committing espionage on behalf of intelligence services for the former Soviet Union and their successors. He was caught red-handed placing a package containing highly classified information at a park in Vienna, Virginia for his Russian handlers. When the FBI 
FBI searched his apartment, it became apparent his payment was in cash and diamonds with the value of over $600,000. Hansen handed over dozens of delicate files, including FBI counterintelligence investigative techniques, sources, methods, operations. He exposed the FBI's secret investigation of Felix Block, a foreign service officer for espionage. He pled guilty to 15 accounts of espionage on July 6, 2001 and was sentenced to prison without the possibility of parole. He is considered the most dangerous spy in FBI history. God knows what he said. Number 7 David Carpenter I know Lisa Rena from Dancing with the Stars because I love a good foxtrot. Love it. But she's actually more well known for being a desperate housewife. But it turns out that her very own mother was actually David Carpenter's first victim. She knew him from work and he offered to give her a ride home and he had kids and a wife. Soon he was on top of her, hammer and knife in hand, but thankfully a cop was nearby who suspected something was amiss, so she was saved. David was sentenced to 14 years in prison where he was diagnosed as a sociopath with a very high IQ. He was released after only 9 years and quickly went on to commit more attacks against women. Good call on releasing him, just saying. Like what? Ugh. I hate that. I hate that. At one time, he was even suspected of being the Zodiac Killer. Instead, he became known as the trailside killer who would prey on women on hiking trails. He took the lives of 10 people, though it's probable that there were more. Just two survived, and officers described that he was a kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of behavior. He was super nice, but then he had this insane, psycho creepy dark side as well. Number 6 Zacharias Musawi The ADX prison is intended as a holding cell to teach prisoners proper conduct before they are sent to penitentiaries. However, some are so bad that they are never released for fear they might inspire new crimes if allowed to communicate to those outside the walls. Zacharias is one of them. He is currently serving out 6 life sentences for assisting the hijackers who carried out the, you guessed it, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. Musawi was placed on a watch list in 1999. He started interacting with Islamist extremists. He could have prevented the attacks entirely, however he lied to the FBI about the Al Qaeda and their plans to attack the US. He was even supposed to pilot a plane into the White House. He was arrested in August 2001 and went on trial in 2006. Throughout the trial he praised the Al Qaeda and was removed for several outbursts. A very different tone to the note he wrote recently in 2020 renouncing Al Qaeda and appeal to younger Muslims to be wary of their deceptive ways. I really do hope he has genuinely released those ideals, however he did do it in an attempt to relax his sentence. As recently as 2018, he was still referring to himself as a natural born terrorist, so needless to say, I don't see things relaxing anytime soon. Number 5 The Marathon Bomber, Jahar Sarnayev. Speaking of the ADX prison, there is yet another permanent resident behind its walls. Jahar Sarnayev is responsible for the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing, which took the lives of three people and injured 250 people in the large crowd. This event shook the world, and I remember when it happened. I remember checking my phone repeatedly in order to figure out what's happening and follow with updates. And I'm sure a lot of you do too. He and his brother Tamerlane used two pressure cookers packed with explosives and shrapnel. His brother was shot during a police chase while Jahar was taken into custody. He was 19 when he committed the crime and 21 when he was finally tried. The trial consisted of heartbreaking testimonies from families of the injured and the dead. The death penalty was disbanded in Boston for decades, but it was considered for this case as it was a federal case. He was instead given his life sentence to be served out in solitary confinement with no opportunities to communicate with the outside world and that is probably how it's going to remain for the rest of his life. Wow, so young. Number 4 The Nathari Killers The Nathari crimes came to light on December 29, 2006 after 8 skeletal remains of young bodies were found in the drain of a house in Nathari, Noida. The owner of the house and the businessman Mohinder Singh Pander and the domestic help Surinder Kohli were arrested. Soon after they were found, even more bodies turned up. The village had been making noise about the disappearances for a while before anything was done, but now the Nathari killers remain some of the most horrific people behind bars. Over 16 young people fell victim to kidnapping, vicious bodily violations and death, which believed to have occurred between 2005 to 2006. Both men have been found guilty and the death penalty is in discussion, though has been delayed. Some believe that there is money involved in the case that may result in an unfair result, but considering the severity of the case, release is not really on the table. I'm not going to lie, it was hard to get a straight story on this, there is a lot of convoluted details across the articles I could find, so if you have more info you want to share, drop it down below. 
Number three, Larry Hoover. This dude is so powerful that he was continuing to run his operation while serving out a 200 year sentence for murder. Larry Hoover was, slash is, I suppose, the chairman of the notorious gangster disciples gang. He was convicted two decades ago of continuing to run his empire behind bars. Hoover, now 70, is serving out six life sentences at the Supermax Federal Prison in Florence, Colorado, a facility that holds the worst of the worst terrorists, mobsters, anyone who'd be a danger to anyone. From the outside. It is said to be the most secure in the country. He established the gang in Chicago in the 1960s and has recently decided to try and take some of them down. The indictment accused seven state and national leaders of the gangster disciples of racketeering conspiracy, drug trafficking, witness intimidation, and multiple murders, including the 2018 death of a 65 year old ranking member of the gang on Chicago's south side. Beware if you've ever crossed Larry Hoover, because even behind bars, you can't stop him. Number two, James Marcello. I honestly sound like I'm in a 1940s film noir when I was researching this. You'll see why in a second. He is the highest ranking Chicago mob boss in prison, also known as Jimmy the Man Marcello. Now at the age of 76, he filed a petition in June 2020 to have his sentence tossed out. Jimmy was one of five top criminals who were convicted of the 2007 Family Secrets racketeering case. He was convicted of taking the lives of Tony the Ants Belotro and his brother Michael. They were found in a cornfield in June 1986 after being beaten and strangled to death in Jimmy's basement. He was sentenced to life in prison in 2009 and currently resides at the Supermax facility in Colorado just like Mr. Hoover. Marcelo's father was also in the biz and so was his big brother, Big Mickey. The family had influence. There were crimes that hit the news and crimes no one knows about. Either way, now Jimmy wants out. He's like, ah, come on, give an old guy a break. Not for you, Jimmy. Not for you. Starting off this countdown, we have Nikolai Zumagaliev. This guy is so evil that it's hard to believe what he did was real. So Nikolai is a Soviet serial killer who took the lives of at least 10 people in the 1980s. He would target women and would often ax them to death, after in which he would eat them. In fact, he was given the name Metal Fang because he had false teeth made from white metal. That way, it was easier for him to be able to eat into the flesh. In the late 1980s, he was caught after having one of his friends over, and the friend found a human head and intestines inside of his fridge. After that, he was arrested and tried but declared insane. In 1989, when he was transported to another facility, Nikolai actually escaped and was on the run for two years. Thankfully, he was caught and re-institutionalized. But in December of 2016, he escaped again. But officials refused to confirm the claim. Either way, be careful around this guy, like he might try and escape for the third time. Moving on to number 9, we have Alan Leger. Alan Leger is a Canadian serial killer who on June 21st of 1986 entered a convenience store in Black River Bridge, New Brunswick with two other accomplices and robbed the joint. While doing so, they beat the store owner to death. But they were later caught and arrested. He was given a life sentence and sent to prison. However, in 1989, he managed to escape and was on the run for seven months. During this time, he killed four more innocent people. He also committed arson and a list of other crimes as well. Eventually, he was recaptured and is now spending the rest of his life in Canada's Maximum Security Special Handling Unit. Moving on to number eight, we have Rodney Halbauer. Ever since Rodney was young, he has been committing crimes. It started when he was only 16 years old. During his younger years, he was arrested and released on parole a number of times. But when released, he would commit more crimes, like theft. In 1975, Rodney was released on bail after taking advantage of a lost Vegas blackjack dealer. But while on bail, he took advantage of and killed six other women and received a life sentence. However, in 1977, he actually escaped jail and kidnapped his own daughter. Shortly after, he was recaptured only to escape again in 1986. While on the run, he stabbed and injured another woman. Thankfully, once again, he was recaptured. Wouldn't you think after the first time they would keep a closer eye on him? I guess not. In our seventh spot, we have Thomas Silverstein. Now this dude is said to be one of the most dangerous prisoners of all time and the most violent prisoner in America. He was first jailed in 1978 for armed robbery. While in jail, he killed a prison officer and two inmates. He also was the leader for the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang for quite some time. This prison gang is the largest and deadliest prison gang in the US with an estimated 20,000 members inside the prison and on the streets. Because of how many people he killed and injured in prison, 
Silverstein got transferred to a federal prison in Atlanta. There, he was confined in a six by seven foot cell. He was under 24 hour surveillance. In fact, the lights in his cell were never turned off so that they could always watch him. Silverstein eventually died in prison at the age of 67. In our sixth spot today, we have Victor Figueroa. On February 6th, 1997, Victor Figueroa managed to escape Moroa Shock Incarceration Facility in Mineville, New York. Victor had been serving a one to four year sentence for drug possession, but decided to take his chances and flee. When authorities noticed that he was missing, they searched the area, but all the leads ran cold. He has not been seen or heard from since. In fact, he's the only New York State prison inmate to escape and never be found. Either he's still out there or he died while trying to escape. Either way, it's a bit scary thinking that he could potentially still be out there. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with James Eddie Diggs. To the public, James Eddie Diggs seemed like a top-notch citizen. He seemed to be a great family man with a happy wife and two young sons. However, in the morning of May 26, 1949, he shot and killed his wife and kids before disappearing forever. Police did manage to find him a week later, but he managed to escape the officer by shooting him in the face and killing him. He since fled into the woods and hasn't been caught since. In fact, he was one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives for the longest time, but he was eventually removed from the list in 1961 and is said to be dead by now. In our third spot, we have George Edward Wright. In 1962, George Edward Wright was convicted for murder and was sentenced to up to 30 years in prison. Wright and three other men went on a spree of armed robbery, one in which they shot a man and took off with his money, which was only $70, so was it really worth it? Anyways, they were caught and put into jail. But then in 1970, Wright managed to escape from a prison in New Jersey. He was caught and locked up once again, only to escape once more in 1972. This time, he made sure he was never going to be caught again. So he came up with a plan. This plan involved hijacking a Delta Airlines flight and collecting ransom for the release of the passengers. Upon doing so, they flew the plane to Portugal. In 2011, the police caught up with him in Portugal, but since Portugal has no extradition treaty with the United States, Wright was released. He remains a fugitive to this day. Coming in at number two, we have Eric Rudolph. In 1996, Eric Rudolph bombed Atlanta's Centennial Olympic Park during the Summer Games. As a result, two individuals were killed and over 100 were injured. But that was just the beginning of his deadly bombing spree. He pulled off three more bombings, injuring hundreds more. For five years, the police were on a hunt for Eric. At one point, he was one of the top 10 fugitives on the FBI's list. It wasn't until 2003 that Eric got arrested. Turns out that he was hiding in the mountains for five years. Being a skilled outdoorsman, this helped him greatly. When he was caught, he pled guilty to all four bombings and was given four life sentences without the possibility of parole. He's now spending the rest of his life in the super prison in Florence, Colorado. And in our number one spot today, we have Santiago Maduros. In 2010, Santiago fired into a random person's car because one of the passengers was wearing the wrong color jacket. The victim had no ties to any gang. He was just an innocent person riding in his sister's car. He was severely injured and his sister was unfortunately killed. A couple weeks later, Santiago and some of his friends were robbing a car. And when a group of men tried to stop them, he shot at them as well. He killed a random person that was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. From there, he was on the run for about a decade. He was finally caught in 2020 in Mexico. Starting off this countdown, we have the Hitchhiker's Killer. The Hitchhiker's Killer is the name given to serial killer Donald Henry Gaskins. He started his killings in 1969, where he would pick up hitchhikers to later kill them. It's believed that he killed more than a dozen people. But even before he went on this killing spree, Gaskins had a history of sick crimes. Finally, on November 14th of 1975, Gaskins was arrested after a man witnessed him killing two men and called the police. Police. He was later sentenced to death, but this sentence turned into life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. However, his killings did not stop while behind bars. While in prison, he became the only man to have ever killed an inmate on death row. In our ninth spot today, we have Glenn Stark Chambers. In January of 1975, Glenn Stark Chambers got into a heated dispute with his girlfriend, Connie Weeks. It ended with him taking her life. As a result, he was sentenced to death by electric chair, later reduced to life imprisonment. However, Glenn escaped prison on July 13th. Glenn, with two other inmates, ganged up to attack their detention officer and then escaped through a window. Now, he was captured three days later, but only to escape several years later. So he worked with the prison to help build furniture. 
he came up with a good idea to put himself into one of the boxes and have himself carried out of prison in a transport truck, and it worked. Even after three decades, Glenn has never been found. If he was still alive today, he would be in his 70s, so he could still be out there somewhere. In our eighth spot, we have Ted Bundy. Now, what was so scary about Ted Bundy is how smart he was. He was the definition of evil genius. So basically, he would use his smarts to manipulate women and then kill them. Bundy is said to be responsible for murdering 30 women, although it's thought that his number is much higher. Now, Bundy was actually able to escape custody multiple times. The first time, he jumped out of a second story building and fled while at the courthouse. He had planned this for days, practicing jumping from his top bed bunk in prison down to the floor to strengthen his ankles. Now, eventually he was caught, but then a while later, he escaped again. This time, he forced himself to lose weight in order to squeeze through a hole in his cell ceiling. When he did escape the second time, he went on to murder more women until being caught once again. In our seventh spot, we have Charles Manson. Infamous cult leader Charles Manson, who led the Manson family cult, had his followers commit crimes and murders on his behalf. Some of his members committed a series of nine murders in July and August of 1969. In 1971, Manson was convicted of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder for the deaths of seven people, including film actress Sharon Tate. What's scary about Manson is that he was also an evil genius. If you've ever seen his interviews, he actually acts quite wild and strange. People think that he's out of his mind. At one point, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and paranoid delusion disorder. But some people think that he was just too smart for his own good and he was just faking all of this. In 1971, Manson received the death sentence, but a year later, the government got rid of capital punishment, so his sentence was changed to life in prison instead. In our sixth spot, we have Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Between 1963 and 1965, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley worked together to torture, take advantage of, and kill a number of young individuals. What they did was incredibly messed up and it'll make your stomach churn. Now, these two were actually given the name the Moors Murderers because after taking the lives of their victims, they would bury their bodies on the Moors outside of Manchester. Both individuals were sentenced to life in prison for their crimes. Ian was actually placed in solitary confinement, whereas Myra died in prison in 2002. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Lester Eubanks. In 1965, Lester was convicted of taking the life of Mary Ellen Diener. As a result, he was given the death penalty, which later got changed to a life sentence. Now, over the years in prison, apparently Lester changed his ways and became very well behaved. In fact, on December 7th, 1973, they let him go out to Christmas shop for his family. While out in a mall, he managed to escape his guards and flee. To this day, he still hasn't been caught. He's out there somewhere in hiding. Who knows where he fled to or what he's up to now. Coming in at number four, we have Robert William Fisher. Now, this guy is one of the FBI's most wanted fugitives. He is on the run after a triple homicide and arson. On April 9th, 2001, Fisher took the lives of his wife and two children before blowing up their house. It is still unclear as to why he did this, and he's been on the run ever since. And please, have no leads. On April 20th, his car was found in a forest near Payson, Arizona, but Robert was nowhere to be found. On November 3rd, 2021, Fisher was removed from the FBI's most wanted fugitives list. But despite them doing this, he still remains a very wanted fugitive. In our third spot, we have Bradford Bishop. Bradford Bishop Jr. is a former United States Foreign Service officer who is now a wanted fugitive. On March 1st of 1976, Bishop started to spiral after not receiving receiving the promotion he really wanted. He then left his work early, drove to the bank, withdrew money, and then bought a sledgehammer, gas can, shovel, and pitchfork. He then returned home where he killed his wife, mother, and three sons. He then drove the bodies several miles away before burying them in a wooded swamp area before setting them on fire. As a result, he was placed on the FBI's list of 10 most wanted fugitives. They have no clue as to where Bishop is now. He could be anywhere, but they do believe that he fled to Europe. Moving on to number two, we have Arthur Hutchinson. Arthur Hutchinson has lived a life of crime for murder, attempted murder, theft, and burglary. In fact, he spent five years in prison for the attempted murder of his half-brother. In September of 1983, he was brought into a police station after being arrested for theft. While there, he asked to go to the bathroom and then proceeded to jump out of the bathroom window and fled. He was on the run for three and a half weeks. While on the run, he crashed a wedding and murdered the bride's father 
father, mother, and brother. Later that day, he broke into another person's home and stabbed all three of the residents to death. He was finally caught on November 5th of 1983 and sentenced to life imprisonment. And in our number one spot today, we have Ahmed Suraji. From 1986 to 1997, Ahmed took the lives of 42 females. The bodies of his victims were found in a sugarcane field. What he would do was after killing them, he would bury them waist deep in his field with their heads facing his house. He believed that by doing so, this gave him great power. But he was later caught and arrested alongside his sisters and three wives who helped him. One of his wives was actually sentenced to death, but that was later changed to life imprisonment. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Angel Resendez. Also known as the Railroad Killer, Angel is said to have committed somewhere around 23 horrific crimes during his spree in both the United States and Mexico in the 1990s. He went on to become known as the Railroad Killer because of the fact that most of his crimes were committed near railroads where he had just jumped off of trains he was using to travel around the country. Most of his crimes took place in the homes of those he harmed, and usually after the crimes he'd linger around to eat their food and sometimes steal their sentimental items. Sometimes he'd even take jewelry to re-gift to his mother and sister. In June of 1999, he was listed on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list, and when his sister saw him there, she was worried he would continue harming people, so she thankfully contacted the authorities. After this, they were able to convince him to surrender and he was sent to trial. In the end, he was sentenced to death by the jury, and although there were multiple appeal attempts, his death warrant was signed, and on June 27, 2006, he received his sentence. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Long Island Serial Killer. Also known as the Craigslist Ripper, the LISK is an unidentified suspect who is believed to have taken the lives of 10 to 16 people over the last 20 years. The victims so far that are known have been sex workers who used Craigslist to advertise their work. After the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert, police were searching an area along the Ocean Parkway, and that is when they began to discover the remains of the victims. The first four were found in December of 2010, with another six being found in March and April of 2011. As of December 2015, the FBI is now officially involved in the investigation. There has been a suspect in this case, but any formal charges have not been laid in terms of these crimes. The most recent evidence in regards to these cases was a belt found at the scene of the crime, which may potentially belong to the killer. At the same time, it was announced that new scientific evidence was being used in the investigation, but these announcements came just last year, so we have yet to receive any further updates. Hopefully this case is solved quickly so that the families of the victims can receive justice and this terrible person is off the streets for good. In our number 8 spot today, we have Richard Chase. This evil person is said to have taken the lives of six people within the span of a month between 1977 and 1978. That's a lot of people in a very short amount of time, which is absolutely terrifying. Before his crimes, Richard's life was already full of terrible stories and horrific acts that had him spending time in mental institutions before his crime spree. While at these facilities, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, but after going through treatment and beginning medication, he was deemed to no longer be a threat to society and was released into his mother's care. Here's where things take a turn for the worse, however. Instead of helping take care of Richard, his mother instead weaned him off of his medication and got him all set up with his own apartment. Nice. Really helpful and cool of her. Initially, when he moved into the apartment, he had roommates, but eventually they all moved out and he was alone, which is when things really got wild. He began killing various animals, which he would then eat raw, sometimes mixing the organs with Coca-Cola in a blender and then drinking it. It's horrible. After this, he would unfortunately go on his killing spree, which had horrific details and would only end when he was startled by a visitor at the home of where his final crime took place. He fled the scene, but he was later caught and stood trial. Although there were many attempts to have him be spared of the death sentence, in the end, this didn't work. In December of 1980, Richard was found passed away in his jail cell after taking too many of his prescribed medication. In our number 7 spot today, we have Rodney Alcala. Rodney is a horrible monster who was convicted and sentenced to death for five killings that he committed in California from 1977 to 1979. He also received an additional 25 years to life after pleading guilty to two other killings in New York in 1971 and 1977. Rodney got away with his crimes for a while because he wasn't the top of the list of suspects because he was said to be the, quote, charming photographer. Photographer. Rodney is often referred to as the dating game killer because of his appearance on the show, which, with what we now know about him, is absolutely horrifying. What's crazy is that he actually won the show he was on, but the episode's bachelorette refused to go on a date with him because she found him creepy. 
This is just a reminder to always trust your instincts. It isn't exactly known just how many victims Rodney had, it is potentially thought that it could be much higher than the number he was convicted for. In July of last year, Rodney passed away in prison at the age of 77. In our number 6 spot today, we have Charles Cullen. This guy used to be a nurse who took the lives of his patients throughout his career and he may be one of the worst serial killers ever recorded. He confessed to taking the lives of 40 people, but through subsequent interviews, it became apparent that the number was way higher than 40, he just couldn't remember the names of all of them. But of course, he could remember the details of all of his crimes against them. His crimes started in 1988 and spanned over a decade into 2003. In October of 2003, when a patient at a hospital passed away from low blood sugar, the authorities were called. This person was Charles' final victim, and authorities began looking into him and investigating his past employment history. On December 12, 2003, authorities were arresting him and charging him with only one count of his crimes, but he ended up admitting to 40. He ended up pleading guilty to his crimes and arranged a plea deal where authorities would not seek the death penalty if he cooperated. During one of his court proceedings, he continuously asked the judge to step down and apparently repeatedly chanted for 25 minutes straight, even after he was restrained and gagged for his outbursts. It is thought that his victims might be up in the 400 range, which is truly just unbelievable. In our number 5 spot today, we have John Allen Muhammad and John Lee Malvo. This pair is referred to as the DC Snipers and they were responsible for a series of coordinated attacks during a three-week period in October of 2002. The pair took the lives of 10 people and critically injured three others during this spree, although their crimes spanned even before this and involved even more people. Their crimes were random and terrifying. People would just be going about their everyday tasks when this horrific pair would strike. Through a series of quote unquote mistakes the pair made, they were able to be caught by authorities and arrested. In September of 2003, John Allen was sentenced to death and this sentence was carried out in November of 2009. John Lee, on the other hand, was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences, but very recently it was determined that his sentence needs to be re-looked at because of his young age when the crimes were committed. In our number four spot today, we have Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. A two for one of the most horrific kind, this pair was often referred to as the tool box killers. They received this name because most of what they used to commit their crimes would be items normally stored in a household toolbox. The pair committed five of these crimes in Southern California over a five month period in 1979. In the end, what led to their capture was when Roy met up with a friend with whom he had previously been incarcerated with. He confessed to the crimes to this person in great detail, and you know what this person did? They consulted their attorney about this horrifying confession who then advised them to go to the authorities with the information. Thank goodness. Authorities, while they didn't have the evidence necessary to charge the men with the crimes at that time, were able to, through surveillance, find other things to arrest them for, while they searched their homes to find the evidence that they really did need. The pair stood trial and in the end, Lawrence was sentenced to death and Roy, who accepted a plea bargain and agreed to testify against Lawrence, received a life sentence. Lawrence died of natural causes while on death row in December of 2019, as did Roy at the California Medical Facility in 2020. 20. FBI Special Agent John E. Douglas described Lawrence as the most disturbing individual for whom he has ever created a criminal profile. In our number 3 spot today we have Robert Hansen. Robert is often referred to as the Butcher Baker and his story truly is horrific. He is one of the most prolific serial killers in Alaska's history because for over a decade he would kidnap women and bring them into the wilderness where he would then stalk them like prey. The reason he got away with his crimes for so long is because outside of these horrifying crimes, Times, he was just a soft spoken baker. Robert was heading to church by day and prowling the streets at night. What led to the downfall of this horrible monster was a badass named Cindy Paulson who was able to escape from Robert and was sure to leave evidence behind. She then went to authorities and told them what happened and this led to a search warrant for Robert's property which is where all the evidence they needed lied. Robert is believed to have taken the lives of at least 17 women and in 1983 he was sentenced to 461 years and a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In our number 2 spot today we have William Bonin. This horrible person is said to be responsible for taking the lives of 21 young men in Southern California from May of 1979 to June 1980. It is said that on at least 12 of these occasions he was assisted by one of his four known accomplices and it is even speculated that he might be responsible for 15 more of these crimes that evidence hasn't officially been able to connect 
connect him to. He was often referred to as the freeway killer because of the fact that most of the bodies were found along the freeway of Southern California. The police surveilled William until they could catch him in the act, which they did. In the beginning, he claimed innocence. I mean, they caught him in the act. It's kind of dumb to claim innocence. But after receiving an impassioned letter from one of the victim's mothers, which asked him to please share the location of her son's body, he confessed his guilt. But he made sure to clarify that it wasn't so the mother could be at peace or so that her pain could be eased. No, of course not. Instead, he said, quote, I was dying for a hamburger and I knew if I went out with the cops, they would get me a hamburger. At his first trial, the prosecutor described him as, quote, the most arch evil person who ever existed. William was convicted on 14 of his crimes and was sentenced to death. He spent 14 years on death row before his sentence was carried out in 1996. In our number one spot today, we have Israel Keys. Israel is quite a prolific serial killer and truly is a terrifying person. While everyone on this list is horrible, Israel is particularly scary because of the fact that he had no MO or type. He just killed at random. In fact, he was so prepared for these random crimes that he left kill kits all over the US so that he would be prepared for whenever whoever he chose crossed his path. It isn't quite clear how many of these crimes he committed and many missing persons reports that are still open could potentially be linked to him. It is said that Israel had a sort of admiration and obsession with other prolific serial killers like Ted Bundy or Robert Hansen who we already talked about today. He even said quote, I probably know every single serial killer that's ever been written about. It's kind of a hobby of mine. So creepy. In March of 2012, Israel was finally apprehended and was to stand trial for his crimes, but unfortunately, while waiting for trial, he went on to take his own life. He left behind a note and a drawing of 11 skulls, which led authorities to believe that this may be the number of victims he had. Mm -hmm. 